This is Jon Bakker from Kampfar and you are listening to the Thomas Eriksson podcast. Hi everybody and welcome back to the Thomas Eriksson podcast and uh, I am Thomas Eriksson. For those of you who are getting to know who I am right now, perhaps, uh, I am the creator of the Norwegian black metal band uh, Mork, and I also do this podcast on the side as, I don't know, just for fun. I've been a fan of podcasts for a couple of years now, and uh, I just thought, hey, what the heck? If uh, they can do it, I can do it. So thank you for tuning in. And uh, of course, I'm doing uh, all this for uh, free, the podcasting. So uh, if you would like to support uh, myself, my music and my podcast, I would appreciate if you do so by, um, for example, visiting the official uh, Mork band uh, web shop and pick up uh, vinyls, CDs, t-shirts, or anything that that can be found in there. That would be much appreciated. The link uh, you can find in the description. And uh, I'm also uh, willing to perhaps do some uh, session work if you need some guitar, bass, drums, or some vocals. Just... Uh, be sure to make contact and we can try to figure out something just to expand myself a little bit. I did do the... I haven't done much session work actually because I've been focusing 100% on my own stuff. But uh, what comes to mind uh, right now is that I did uh, all of the bass for the latest... uh, album of uh, the British black metal band The Death Trip and uh, you can check that out I am a quite varied uh, bass player and uh, also guitar player musician so uh, get in touch all right uh, enough uh, self promoting Uh, this week I uh, am joined by uh, Yet another special guest from the black metal world. And this time we are going to uh, Hønefoss, which is a city located in uh, Norway. And uh, we are talking about the band Endesma and uh, its creator and uh, frontman Morten Schacks. He uh, dropped by uh, an evening here and uh, we had a fine chat. Interesting guy, actually. I, I've known this guy for uh, many years now, but I didn't know all these uh, things he has done besides being the front man and singer in Endesma. Uh, he's done, uh, he, did, he did some fan scene and he uh, had his own label. An interesting guy and an interesting story. So uh, just stick with us and uh, I give you Morten Shocks of Endesma. Det var en trivelig det altså. Koser oss kaffe og småregn utenfor og skikkelig... Hjemmekos i halden. Det er det, og så er det jo levende lys og baffometen i det fjerne. Ja, det blir ikke bedre det her, altså. <laughs> All right, I'm sitting in the living room studio again, and today I'm joined by the one and only Morten Schacks of the Norwegian black metal band Endesma. Yes. Hallo, hallo. Hello, hello. Hello. Testing. Testing, testing. All right, so you're back in halden again. Back in halden again, Yes. It's been soon a year since we played at the fortress here. It's been a year, that's true. Yeah, actually. It was uh, previous summer. It was previous summer, yes. At so the Imperium. At the Imperium. It was a nice experience. It's a nice location. 
So yeah, actually, one year passed. Uh, yeah, it's been flies. a crazy year, but still, yeah. it's like this with uh, things where well, all things happen in one way. It feels like yesterday. On the other hand, it feels like ten years ago because it's been such a strange year. Everything is just put on hold. Yes, exactly. But I was so. thinking just before you came here now, I was thinking about when did we meet for the first time? I think that was in Sarsborg for, I don't know, maybe yeah. 12, 13 years ago. Really? So so long time back? I yeah. think so. We played, uh, yeah, was it when we played the gig here with Ragnarok? Yes. You, yeah, you think about that uh, occasion, yes. Uh, yes, I remember we met back then and that was maybe the first time yes yeah it must have been a, it's really so long many years ago yeah there. wasn't it in 2008 or something uh, that could be it was was it with Yonto or no it was right after Yonto quit the drums so because uh, it was with Ragnarok but first gig with a new drummer yeah it could be 2008 or 9 8 Maybe. Maybe. You, I, I, I don't remember. you know what? I believe that Hans Fischte was singing. <coughs> with us? No, with uh, with uh, Ragnarok. Yeah, that could, oh, yeah. but Junto played with you guys? Yeah. Okay, he did not do that on that gig. No, that was uh, Jonas on drums back then, I think, on that gig. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, Junto, yeah, he played the drums. He was the first drummer. <laughs> I did not know that. We <laughs> need to come know. back to this yeah, yeah. <laughs> later on. Yes, of course. <laughs> So yeah, we met so so many years back. Yeah, so we're going far back then. We go way back, as they say. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, you <coughs> asked me to join once, right? We had uh, back then. We had quite a little bit turbulent lineup. So we were a little bit in and out, and so at one point we was, uh, and we had Trunder Nefas in the band playing other in other bands and gigs so we was uh, always back then in need for a stepping guitarist oh, in one the, way or another the Urge Hall guy yes oh, yes, yes yeah obviously yeah so and i remember you told me that uh, i was really handsome and looked good uh, yeah yeah so that you... was uh, important we was looking for <laughs> handsome guys your guitar skills didn't matter it was uh, <laughs> First and foremost, it was the look we was after, yes. So. I feel like an object now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag me too. Yes. <laughs> All right, man. We need to talk about you. We need to open you up and Ooh. like a white book. Aye, yeah. aye, aye, aye. So uh, let's start with uh, Scary. where are you from? Where I'm from? You're I'm, from Hønefoss, right? I'm from Hønefoss, yes. From a village outside Hønefoss, Uh Hausbygd, but uh, for people outside Hønefoss, uh, it's the it's the place, the town. Yeah. So yeah, I grew up outside Hønefoss, and I'm still living there. Yeah. So uh, I'm uh, I haven't went far away from the nest. The same as me. I'm from yeah. Halden, born and bred. You know, yeah, I'm yeah. still here. But yeah. So. Uh, I like that. Uh, it's close. One hour drive from Oslo. Yeah. If you want to be urban, you, there's well, if it's happened there, you have a short short drive there and still you can go on the so say countryside and I I born with a forest outside my window and, uh, yeah. and that's what I like. Even I can be urban at in periods, but still it's the nature and the forest and the countryside that really appeals to me. It's so. okay to go to Oslo for a show and go to the pub. Exactly. But it's awesome to go back home. It's always good to yes. go back home. I have the precise same feeling because a big city, it stresses me a bit out. Yeah. So one exactly. weekend is the max. Yeah, that's, that's true. And then you feel about the reason why you actually live where you're living yes <laughs> when you're getting back <laughs> so yeah so how was your childhood it was very good i only have nice images from my childhood all golden good images i don't know if i just wiped out the bad ones or if it's uh, but i i i have just good memories from my childhood regular and, norwegian yeah, upbringing yeah totally yeah, your parents were separated or together? No, they was uh, married. So uh, yeah, 
Uh, Mine too. Living, yeah, living together. And uh, yeah, so I have now nothing to complain about. No divorces, no uh, tragedies in families or anything. So yeah. But we, we, we found black metal either way. <laughs> we find it anyway. Yeah. It's some, I guess some people, uh, maybe some outcast people looked for something like uh, some punk, black metal, whatever, to just uh, fill a certain void in their life or something. Yeah. But uh, for me, it was maybe a different approach yeah. to it. Yeah. Let's talk about that. How did you come into music? What what was the first thing? Uh, the first thing I was really early, like interested in music. Like uh, my father had uh, country music records at home. Listen, I didn't. There was no metal or anything back home or rock, but uh, there was. The, but I early noticed that I was like interested, you know, to cassettes and. Johnny Cash and whatever, and you know, when I was always like into booklets, reading lyrics, like it was always appealing to me, like to, and I always want to search, find out about artists and everything just appealed to me. And What, then, what age were you at then? Uh, then that could be seven, eight, yeah. like that. When was this? I, I don't remember how old you are. Oh, too old, too cold. I am a 1977 model. So this was in uh, in the 80s. This in the early 80s. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, and then I had my neighbor. That was my uncle and aunt and my cousin. He was like uh, five years older than me, and he had a bunch of friends, and they was all metalheads and into metal and. But of course, they was a little bit older than me, so, but I was sneaking around there and in his room full of posters, ACDC, Wasp, Motley Crue. And of course, that was like a mecca and I went to, I just sitting in the bookshelves looking through albums and uh, hearing this music and then copied cassettes, bringing home and just sitting, uh, listening through them out again and again. And You're lucky them. Them. Yeah, they were, yeah, actually, I could just go across the fence and search through whatever he had in his uh, record uh, collection and copied music and that's how it started. Yeah. Really? With bands like ACDC, Accept, Twisted Sister and all this, uh, this type of bands. And I was, uh, from my friends, there was, but I was always a little bit more into it. Like, you know, I would, like I said, listening to the lyrics, into the whole package. I was like, this was something that you really... Were you were feeling the atmosphere yeah, and sounds. Totally, and, totally. Back then, oh. you know, we was running around with your um, Walkman, you yeah. know, so I couldn't go one step without having something music, listening to some old hard rock band. If it was ACDC, Motley Crue, Accept, Wasp, whatever, it's just spinning all the time. I, I had remember, some soundtrack to my... I, I remember when I was young, or younger, I was really... Uh, it was important to me to connect the sound with the artwork. Yeah. And stuff, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So you, you, you mentioned ACDC. Mm -hmm. uh, I love ACDC, it's my favorite band. Yeah. Uh, the, the record, the flick or the switch, the switch, yes, the white with the, cover, yeah, yeah, with the big uh, switch, yes. Uh, I remember that is that is white and it is plain and really dry looking, mm -hmm. and then it fitted the sound on the album, which is also like really dry. Even. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you could comprehend to the sound, yeah, yes. connecting it with. Yeah, that, that's true. And some strange way, I, yeah. I, I made that happen with all the ACDC albums. Really? Yeah. yeah. Uh, not the Bon Scott ones, but the Brian Johnson ones. Okay. The bronze one with the yeah. cannon, the black one. Mm. Yeah, the black, yeah. Back in Blind, that's yes. only what you, what you felt then, totally darkness. Yeah, it, yeah <laughs> the, I, th I actually thought that the sound was a bit black. Yeah, yeah. A bit heavy and black. Yeah, yeah. But that means that uh, the visual and the core is, uh, is important for you, no? Yes. That's like, that's, uh, that's something that really... Uh, and it's, uh, there's something there. Yeah. You, you yeah. have a feeling and an aesthetic sense. Exactly. Which um, make you into yeah, a potential artist. <laughs> exactly. Because that's uh, why I always also interest, like I told you, the booklets and the lyrics and everything and, you know, the package and their style. And that's why... I, Easily like picked up the more extreme act 
depths in the horror. You know, you have the like wasp, like yeah. you know those that had a little bit rougher image yes. that appealed to me. And uh, but most maybe my fave is like uh, Matthew Cruden. So that, yeah. Yeah, but but still that they have like uh, you know that was the wild side of it. You know the crazy behavior and the fuck off attitude and also like that punkish uh, the punk attitude that fuck you all thing yeah so that appealed to me and um so that's uh so i had some few but still i was i was loving all all the music band there was black sabbath led zeppelin yeah if it was all i was just genuinely into it so i was checking out new it was like uh exploring a new feel oh so that was around when I was 10 and all my, from until uh, um, seven to eight degrees. Then I, yeah, on the school, then I remember I got across uh, the Metallica and yeah. uh, I heard Kill Em All first, but that was like, uh, that was something strange. Like I thought, oh, fuck, what's going on here? And then later, I when Injustice for All was new. That was in eighty nine, I think. Eighty eight. Eighty eight. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Then I really got into that, and then really kickstarted me into the, all the heavier shit like uh, Exodus, Slayer, and then I picked up the Trash thing, and mm -hmm. that was the new new thing. And from there, it just escalated into. Then I was always on the search for one more more heavier shit more extreme more so then it just went into death um, metal i suppose and death metal yeah there yeah. was no black metal no. back the back then it was in the in the brewing process yeah, only true. so then it was like napalm death carcass and Entomb and all these bands and for a short period until i actually picked up um, the first dartron album since that was in the bunch of the death metal albums yeah but, but that uh, appeal extra for me because it was something a darker vibe than all you know we got all the napalm death and you but this uh this souls journey had this uh, something made me feel something special so that's i was real that was the first album when Dartrum was uh, supposed to come up with a new album i was i remember i was just counting ah, when will the new album be out and i was totally in the and that's the funny story that we all know what happened with the yep. uh, with the next one. That was uh, not a death metal album at all. So uh, <laughs> so then, of course, first time I picked up a Blaze in Northern Sky, and I thought, oh, finally it's here. And I said, what the fuck is this? What's going on here? I didn't actually. It's like it's like uh, it's like they all tell you know what's it sounds uh, just strange, but but it actually was like this. What the fuck is this? What's the picture? And then. It was like, uh huh. This. But, but when you heard that for the first time, yeah, had you already heard the early Bathory and stuff like that? Mm, no, no. So Dark Throne was the gateway into that stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I heard, I, of course, I heard Slayer and the, the trash the thing, and mm. you know, old Sepultura and stuff. So it was like. But sound-wise, old Bathory is kind of similar to the Dark Throne yeah. stuff. You know? uh, when I look at it now, because Bathory is a strong influence from me now and later on, I was I went into that. But back then, when I heard A Blaze in Northern Sky, yeah. I did not have a Bathory background to no. compare it with. No, no. no. So it was so a me, wow, first time thing. Everything, the, the cover, the visual, the, how they appeared, everything was just like, what the fuck is this? And I think it was one to the first spin because, of course, I, wa I waited for a sequel for Soulside Journey and I got something. So it was like, you know, like you're closing your eyes and you, you think you're putting something you know in your mouth, but then yeah. you're getting something different. So it's just like, it's new. So the mind had to, you know, figure it out. What is this? And, um, but when I figure out, um, it stayed with me since then so um but something happened then with you yeah that was definitely uh something because all all the time when i picked up new things that made something my first time you heard yeah. acds you know first time you I, I can go back now and tell you know what i felt where i was when i heard that uh, album for the first time yes. i can remember it's a moment snapshot yeah, yeah. Mm. So I always had that thing, and I even know now when 
what room I was in when I heard uh, Blaze for the first time. I was with my friend, how I can picture the whole situation, you know, what we did later on that day, you know, it's, wow. I, have, I have those memories. So that was, uh, I guess, since I remember that, that's because it's made such an impact. Yes, 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 yeah. yes. Milestone so, moments in your yeah, lifetime. Yeah. But did, so. did you ever get involved with music before then? Uh, no, I did. I didn't. I did not play an instrument. I was until then. I was just like uh, just ge- genuinely into music. Yeah, yeah, yeah just yeah. listening. Yeah. So what happened uh, thereafter? You started to dive deeper into the this stuff. Yeah. Then it was. Then everything came with this. Uh, then it was uh, Immortal, Rotting Christ, and these first releases, so the the Black Metal Vibe and all the labels, Osmosis, really then it was just like buying everything that came out of those underground labels and just checking out and tape trading, writing letters, the whole that uh, absorbing thing that was in the early 90s, you know, and tape trading uh, all writing with people all, all the time i was just sitting in my room you know and writing with the world and it was just something it's just open a mystery box so everything that that world was so exciting but how did you get into that kind of network did you know people in hernefoss who did that uh, tape trading thing was there a scene or how did you get across this uh these Actually, things no i was yeah, it was back then on the school. It was like maybe one or two people older than me that uh, had contacts that I again started with. But I was a little bit younger than than them back then in '92 or whatever. I must have been. I was like 13 years old, you know. Yeah. So it's not like it's a little bit limited. What kind of how you get around and how you interact with older people then. But then of course. We just figure we find found each other, you know, in the Hörnfoss, and then it was just like a unit of five, six people from different schools and whatever. And of course, that was took short time until we was one unit, you know. But then I was like early on, just sitting, picking up flyers, writing. I just started on this, you know, buying. You got some fan signs and whatever, mm. and then you took it from there. You know, you can just escalate from one buy a magazine and then write and start you know and then it was in the movement in yeah, yeah, way. yeah so yeah so did you know many <coughs> of the musicians by by letters <coughs> uh, yes i was uh, writing letters with uh much people greven and all this oh, you that did was, that <coughs> yeah oh, yeah you'll not that dissection yeah. and all yeah so but that was like you know back then it was like uh, you needed to I don't know, you know, you have in Germany, you have just like people listening to music. You are genuine like fans or whatever music, you have thousands of people just living. But in Norway back then, <clears throat> the, just the scene was like that. Uh, you needed to have some mission, you know, like what's your, you need to have a, a place, like something you do. <clears throat> because that's why all, all people started to make their own bands, you know. I think that was pretty unique in Norway. Like it's popping up, you know. If you was into black metal, you was you, know, you have to. You had a band, or you had a fan, too. Yeah, yeah, you had a fan sign, or you had a yeah. label. You know, we had. You just need to have a your position in one way. Okay. So <clears throat> back then, like because my friends was like uh, we all suddenly we had all our own bands and started, and it was not like you know that we all got together and made one. It was more like when you look back on it now, we all have our different bands, you know, and. But even then, from the early, we was like from one unit of friends, you know. So, but was that specifically in Hønefoss? I don't know. I just know from Hønefoss, but I, th- I don't know. Were you, there, w- was there a scene in Hønefoss? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. If you, if you read some book, uh, I don't know, Hova Rems book about uh, black metal, he said that uh, back then Hønefoss have the highest number of black metal bands, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. From that, uh, if you take the, um, probably based on the rate of how many people, yeah. like uh, it's in uh, probably most because you can't compare to Oslo, of course, or something like that. But uh, yeah, yeah, pretty had uh, pretty lot of bands back then, and we was only like ten people yeah. producing like uh, 12, 13 bands. A lot of projects. A lot of projects. <laughs> Not all of them are. Uh, 
worth mentioning and uh, would be reaching out to the world, but still there was a lot of plans and ideas and projects. Um, so, but then back then it was, I started, uh, then I started with a fan sign. Yeah. Run a fan sign, doing interviews and putting together and uh, making that for a few, a few issues. And really, Just Xerox copies and yeah, that was uh, stapling. And yes, sitting on the library on the school and just uh, Xerox from going to the library, finding pictures and copying and clipping and gluing and going and <laughs> yeah, so cool. totally do it yourself. What uh, was it called, the fan scene? Uh, that was called um, uh, Obscure Epitaph. It was now the one we, I don't know if you noticed, but for a few, was it two years ago now back, uh, we released or Northgrove from Beastcraft, he also had his um, uh, fan scene. Okay. So he, we made, uh, like pressed, uh, took the all the fan scene, like a little bit of besto from the interest I did, and we took it together and made like a really book, uh, bookish uh, publishing out of it. I think it was printed in Mexico. I don't know, I don't remember the number of copies now. Uh, it was uh, Northgrove that, uh, did this and huh. initiated it so he was like uh, distributing and doing the deals but I think it was pretty blown away just like this wow so, yeah but how many issues did you release back then we, we sold maybe 150 200 copies issues yeah. all um, copied and uh, you know it was a uh, it was a heavy production to put together a couple of hundred uh, issues. But it's it's real physical effort to put together with the glue and the picture. So yeah. it it have to, it, it to making have one the first copy. Of course, yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. main thing. But uh, but it has to feel a bit achieving. You know what I mean? Yeah, it of has course, to back feel then, good to do it. Of course, that was uh, that was like a monument for a, it's a it's 14, 14, 15 year old boy yeah. you know, to put up that. Of course, you felt like, oh, this is the shit. I made this. Yes, that was like same feeling <laughs> like you like you made your first album later, you yes. know, that, you know, that same feeling. So back then that was everything. Yeah. Awesome. So that was like, that's what I mentioned, like, some people had a fan sign, some there was banned. Like it was just like seemed like in Norway was like this. You you just got into something, you know. Yes. Like uh, everyone made an effort. Yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. I feel like that when I look back on it, is I feel like that was pretty special for Norway. Like, that is what way. makes the scene strong. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. that's a good point. Yeah. yeah, everyone puts a hand in, you know. Yeah, yeah. But uh, you did you you were like 13 14 15 years old. Yeah. Well, at what point did you first get to go to a concert or something like that? Uh yeah, I remember uh, that must have been in 93. I don't know. There was this um uh, small festival on Lucelotta in Oslo with the dissection satiricon dark funeral Gehenna Gorgrot Marduk, I think. That's a famous one. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but of course, as a 14-year-old uh, kid, that was a problem. We was not allowed to go there. So then it was sneaking and told that they're going to a friend. And we took the bus to Oslo yeah. and uh, got to buy some uh, booze and uh, beers and was drinking in the street. And of course, our second problem was that uh, it was 18 years entrance, of course. Yeah. But back then there was no, there was like no, no obstacle because we just had to get in there. There was no, it was not like we were sitting in Hanfoss and, and thinking, hey, but fuck, it's, we're going there. How can we get in? No, no, that was not the issue. Oh. We are just going there. So, you know, back then it was just like hanging outside or whatever. You just had to be there. Yeah. So we, we went there, but we all had this, you know, this uh, bad uh, copies of, um, what to say this? Uh, we said the leg or whatever you know. Yeah, we had the, this the, uh, ID. ID, ID yeah, yeah. Some, yeah. So oh, there was some. Uh, so you have fake IDs? Yeah, yeah, we have <laughs> fake IDs. You know, we just uh, we scratched out, and that was some guy on the school that did this oh. uh, sitting home, 
like professional uh, mobsters <laughs> doing this, <laughs> making fi- fake ideas. Who are the false ones? Yeah, yeah. So then, <laughs> and that got us in. I remember it we, did? yeah, yeah, we were sitting there looking at the gigs and. And then, of course, when we went in, then we had met some others and was buying us beers. So then awesome. it was in full, full scale. How how, how big uh, was uh, Lusa Lotus? I never went there. Oh my god, that was a small, uh, small place. It was just like a pub, you know, like M Street. Ah, oh, no, smaller. Smaller? I think so. Yeah. Cleveland. So, uh, yeah, closer to that. I really? Would say. Yeah. And closer. it was a venue. Yeah, it was like uh, you know, mostly like when you look back on it now it's more like uh, there would sit a guy with a guitar on a chair you know if a uh, troub- troub- troubadour yeah, thing you know yeah. this stage was maybe a few centimeter yeah, tall yeah, yeah, beside yeah. the bar it was just that small wow. stuff so then uh, but the, the thing was that we couldn't be there um, it was ongoing for two days we could only be there one night because we couldn't copy this doing the same shit over again uh, the next day and we had to go live and catch the last bus so we couldn't see all the band. But I remember I saw Goy Grot with Frost playing drums wow. and uh, and all that back then. And uh, Gehenna with the so drunken vocalist that he fell over the stage and fell asleep. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, it was just a lot of chaos and drunk people and yeah, the good memories. But I think that when you look back on it now, it's... it's it's more like you don't remember how was the sound of the band or whatever you no. know it was just the vibe and just to be there but and the be, sound couldn't have been good that was probably a disaster only from, the amps uh, and the drums acoustically and uh, probably terrible rehearsal so, room sound yeah. but either way you you were there and that was kind of your uh your uh what is it um uh what, uh, dop, uh, what is that? Bapti- baptism. B- baptism. That baptism. was your baptism by fire, <laughs> yes. right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's true. That's true. So, yeah, cool. Yes. Uh, later, then, what uh, got me into music? Uh, then, actually, then I started the band Dim Nagel. What's called back then? Was that straight after this concert thing? Yeah, it was the same age yeah. uh, round. Because I had my friends that I was... Uh, my closest friends back then was the guys from Quist. Yeah. Halvar and Endre and uh, Tom. There was three guys that I was hanging, going in school with, hanging with. And uh, there was really talented musicians. And and they got uh, this sign with uh, Amand Garde already back then when we went. Yeah, we was 15, 16 years and they wow. got a big record deal with Avant Garde hmm. and uh, then they recorded in Endless Studio in Oslo and it was like this was when they made this that was so cool and I thought I, I was thinking this is the shit I want to start my own band I yeah. want to do this shit you know so uh, so what I did then was just uh, I needed a musician so of course I asked them just to join so Practically, it was just uh, I made riff and then I got these guys, to, the quiz guys, uh, Andrew playing drums and Halvar uh, doing guitar. The only thing was I couldn't play the guitar. That was sounding shitty. But back then, you know, this uh, one finger riff and nee, nee, was just like, you know, really, that was really simple shit. Uh, but Andrew, the quiz drummer, was a really... He was a really, really talented drummer, so he made uh, gold out of uh, what to say. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <Yeah. laughs> it worked somehow. It worked for a few dem- demos and stuff. And later, I think we even got signed with the back then Malicious Records. Yeah. Uh, back then, they released uh, Gorgrot albums, I think. And uh, but uh, by the time we really got something to release i think they uh, went bankrupt or something <laughs> so that was that was real label back then you know it was a little bit uh, shady business and yeah. a little bit uh, where, semi-professional uh, where are them they from what uh, is this uh, was not holland i think I oh think yeah so. okay yeah, yeah. The netherlands i think yeah. so anyway um we played then with Dim Nagel, I think yeah, that was maybe a period for a couple of years, releasing two demos. Yeah. And um, uh, we was uh, just rehearsing down in the drummer's basement, the quiz drummer. Yeah. And uh, with them. And 
but then I was making the music and then but then I understood what I wanted to do was like I wanted to be like frontman singing. I was into maybe other aspects of it. I already I thought I was not that interested in the guitar stuff. No. And I was earlier uh, on an early stage I just uh, realized that that's not my I don't have the time and the uh, patience to sit down yeah. to become that uh, as good as I know I need to be yeah. to come there I want to be in one yeah, way yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. that's why I just uh, figure out that I need to do I do need to do it in another way you know yeah so uh, <clears throat> but did you do any shows not with uh, that band no back only then. rehearsing no, and only demos. rehearsing and, and demos yeah. and, uh, and down there I remember a good story when we was uh, rehearsing down <laughs> in the basement of uh the quiz drummer and he was playing and then suddenly his father knocked on the door and then because this is in, back in the 90s you know no mobile phones and that was you had one house phone upstairs you know so yeah. then you it was calling the house and his father was coming down and telling hey yeah you need to go it's a phone call for you you need to take it and then okay then he run up and we was waiting and he's coming back and we ask him hey, okay what was that ah, it was the the guys from empire they called me and uh, they need a drummer, so they asked if I can come on, uh, you know, audition. Wow. And, well, yeah, I said, what fuck, that, that's amazing, man. Because back then, you know, oh, and there wasn't that many musicians, many bands, and and Endring Quisty was like 14 years old, I think, back then, and when he recorded the Kunst Movie album. Yeah. And that was pretty amazing yeah. for from a 14 years. He was really talented. That's and young. That's really young, and he was good even at that stage. Yeah, and there was some link with the Emperor guys from some Hønefoss. So Samut mother, they uh, they noticed uh, the Quist album and his skills, and they called and asked him. And then, uh, so then we asked Henry, okay, so what did you tell him? And this must be amazing. No, I crazy. I told them, uh, hey guys, where are you rehearsing? And they, they told they are rehearsing in Oslo and he told, hey man, I live in Hønefoss, I'm 14 years old, how the fuck can I go to Oslo? So I just told, no way, goodbye. So we hanged on and that's it. <laughs> that's the, wow. <laughs> so <laughs> so that, that's uh, that that's a good story. We always laughed and like, what did you say? Oh, I'd say, fuck, yeah, that's how can I go to Oslo? So then. Uh, it's realistic though. Yeah, he was very realistic. Yeah. So, yeah. So... <laughs> But I, I guess his ambitions wasn't uh, in that high seat either to, uh, in one way. So Is he playing today? No, because unfortunately he got this um, inflammation in his arms that oh. he like this constant, that was just short period after that, that he needed to quiet down with uh, playing the drums. So that, oh. was, that was his... Uh, that was uh, his uh, bad uh, omen, so yeah. to speak. So, Downfall. Yeah. So, so in one way, maybe it was the fortune or the it was meant to be, meant to be in one way. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that's strange. Yeah. All right. So you figure out you wanted to sing. Uh, yeah, but then again, I. Um, that's when I I started up a label. You know, I run the label. Oh, for really? A few years. Yeah. yeah. So that's uh, then. After. What haven't you done? <laughs> yeah, <that's>, <laughs> <laughs> so then, uh, because back then there was uh, my other friends from Hønefoss, Urgal, and there was Strunder Nefas. He had this um, release. There was uh, Sign of No Colors, same label as Dimu released first album. Oh yeah. They released also their debut on No Colors. Urgal. Uh, Urgal. Yeah. Okay. And then. Um, the released Arma Christi album and then there was there was like really running good then and then Ensifer, the guitarist, he was a little bit took a break from the band and the band was a little bit uh, down and then I uh, but Trona was still making music for it but then I don't know at one point there was without um, a label yeah. and he had soon prepared a new album and I was thinking of making a label and he needed a label so then we was just sitting at a party and said hey fuck dude maybe maybe I just 
uh, start a label and then I I release uh, the new Urgal album and then he said yeah that's a good idea that's how we, that's how the the old days you know when <laughs> when plans are made on the party and uh, so the next day I um, I started the label and uh, put myself into that so everything what uh, how to do it how to manufacture albums and the business side and went in with full force feet and head and and uh, what about the money I went to the bank okay l- took lo- a loan took a loan oh man <laughs> yes took a loan and uh, and uh, then I practically did everything concerning that first <laughs> release for uh, for Urgal, I I was involved. I think I made the cover artwork. I not made it, but I just initiated it in one way. Mm. And I I found them a studio, got them into the studio. I think I mastered that album myself. I went to the, yes, uh, did everything uh, there and uh, got uh, uh, got them going there. Uh, released the album same uh, age. Guys, as you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're, here, they're totally the same age. Yeah. I'm born, we are born from being kids together. Uh, went to school together. In not same school, but uh, the neighbor's school, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. From Hönfos, both of us. Yeah. So, um, wow, so you did the promotion and everything? Everything. That was do-it-yourself label, of course. First thing was a new label, because Flesh for Beast was the name of the label. Yeah. So Flesh for Beast, we released the uh, Autumn Kinder album with uh, with Urgal, then we signed Virtual Lord, Blood Sworn. We released the next Urgal. I think we released four four albums. Wow! And then the business started to grow. So in one way, it came to the point where I said, "Is this what I want to do? Now yeah. I need to I need to make it bigger or." Yeah. Shut it down in one way. Go big or go home. Yes, yeah. in one way yeah. because it went to that point. So then I I went home and made new plans. Yeah. <laughs> Did so, you sell the label or uh, just shut it down? In, I one way made a deal with Agonia Records for uh, so that they could uh, release uh, continue printing albums from uh, from Urgal and what we already printed in one way okay so then, yeah but we, like a, on a license li- yeah, or did li- you sell the sell it licensed okay. way like to, yeah 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 and then um with back then i think uh host it and yeah actually yeah that because in that in this period and we did this uh with uh Uriga, we also i uh, i made some gigs uh for i told them you guys need to play abroad so we I just uh, got some contacts in over in Germany, and I got the band over there to play and tour around in Germany. Wow! Because they only played back then in uh, in Norway. So um, that was like I remember Trondheim Nefas is that what the fuck are we doing in Germany? Why well, we need to go there and play? And just yeah, but guys, that's that's what other bands do, you know. There, if you are uh, going somewhere, you need to go across the border and go out there. And so now, nah. so I had to really make a fight to get them over there but they went and the rest is history with them and they are like they just went on to be a full force but i remember that first i think it was first we played some mini tour over there in germany we went quite well they already had a name there you know they had german label and everything and yeah and uh, and, uh, they played some festival i was like then like a what was it then? Like a manager? I don't know. I yeah, was uh, yeah, going yes. with them there. Basically. Yeah. So um, I remember this funny thing. We was on a festival in Germany and they was headlining, I think, this underground festival. And uh, that was like, uh, the bill was pretty good. I think one of the first band that there was Vatain. Yeah. This was in 99 or something, then 99, 2000-ish. Yeah. Mm. So I just remember that night was Vatain, Talke, Schuder, uh, and Urgal. It was a band before Urgal, like what what was the name? Uh, a German uh, act that was called Morgan or something. And they they played before Urgal that night, but they played, they went over over the time so much. So by the time Urgal was supposed to headline, yeah. uh, the the promoter kept, ah, you need to cut down your set now because it's uh, you're going, you can't, the security, few police will come and cut down your set. 
And then I I was back then I was a little bit like uh, said, no fuck way this guy came all the way from Norway we can't do this so I remember I was standing beside the the mixer and just because they wanted to just cut the plug yeah so I was standing like for three songs there and fighting with the promoter and mixer not to allow them to cut the gig too early so and then the they played the, I think the everything or if they just cut it with one song or something but I just remember I was uh, right down there with the uh, making a fight almost to make them play the full set. I mean, you should. Yeah, of course. Yeah. That's uh, That was my role then. That was more yeah. normal. Than, I don't do this stuff now. When I have my own band, I'm nice and jolly guy and I'm... Uh, I'm more. Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be that. Uh, but uh, back then, I say, okay, that's. You more. should come with us and be our yeah. manager. Yeah, easier to fight for others, right? <laughs> yes. <than> your own. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We need a feisty one. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> we all need someone to fight for our rights when we. Uh, yeah. That's true. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Uh, yes, where was we? Um, uh, I guess you you shut down the label. Yeah stop doing that yeah and then i want to start with the uh, with the band yes this is like your first uh, real uh, yeah. effort y- as a singer yes so then uh, that was and desma and then i went to my friend tronde nefas yes and asked him to join me and start up uh, and desma and i had some vision of how i wanted it like to be in sound and what we in one way, uh, we had some bands like in Hønefoss. It was like uh, we had Urigal, Beastcraft, and all like more, more or less primitive. I wanted some more melodies, some more adding uh, piano synthesizer. Some more flavors, more, yeah, yep. a little bit. I was uh, so that was my mission, making it still underground and ugly, but with more, more lawyers into into the music, more depth. Yeah. So then we made the Alone uh, EP as like a start to see, just started out and we made this uh, three song EP and got signed and played gigs, got booked in Germany. We played our first gig in Germany in, what was this, 2006, five, 2006, I think. Okay. Yeah. So... Yeah, it took some time then to make this, and I think the band we started actually was within uh, 2005. Yeah. So, but the EP you're talking about was yeah. that uh, released on a, wh- which label? Uh, Agonia. It? Agonia. Records. It was okay. Yeah. So Agonia. you signed with them. Yeah, the Polish label. Yeah. Agonia. So they released this one. We played a uh, few gigs abroad. Yeah. The lineup back then that that was like. Uh, we mentioned Junto, so yeah. Junto was the first first drummer. But how did you find him? He was uh, he was just there. Junto has always just ar- been always been there <laughs> around. Uh, now nah, he was in the circle of friends, and you know, always been uh, like a friend. And uh, but he's the, from the, the way down here. He's from Sochi. Yeah, which which from so- but I met him around on the. It was out playing, I was out uh, festivals and concerts and, you know, in, just in the scene, meeting yeah. him down the crossroad around Europe and here and there and festivals. And We're talking about Junto Pantera, the drummer of uh, Ragnarok. Ragnarok, yes. 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 So um, the original lineup back then was actually Junto from Ragnarok on drums, uh, Trondor Nefas on guitar. It was supposed to be Örjan Höst from Tokyo on bass guitar. Oh, really? But he was also like a busy guy, so he, um, so uh, we agreed that he's playing on albums and making uh, whenever he can to make it to fit with Tokyo and stuff yeah, to play of gigs. Course, of course. Um, but at the end, it never happened that he played on because we saw right away that was just crashing too yes. much that it was no... Uh, you want to get going. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So that's, we got some other to fill that uh, that spot. And yeah, so basically, but then we had some in and outs, in and out from the, the lineup the first, first couple of years. I think Jonto played for two years or so. He quit it before the first album, full length album came out, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, but did he only have Ragnarok and, and Desma then? 
Yeah, at that point, yes. Yeah. yes. And that was was that the same time that Örjan sang for Ragnarok? Yeah. Okay. The Black yes. Door Miracle period. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Yes. 2003-4. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So that's how you see all this. Uh, yeah, it fits together. <laughs> all fits together. I tried to yeah, reach yeah. out and find the chords. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So uh, yeah. Um, and then we was writing on the next album, the erotic uh, necrosis album and uh, used quite some time doing that and uh, then uh, is that the one with enigma of the solon song on yeah it? yeah for that was the song you sent me to re- yeah yes exactly yeah. yeah yeah that's true it's a really good song yeah yeah thank you yeah that's a uh, that's a good one it's um it was maybe yeah when one of the first songs that was made from that album. I don't remember. Did you got the songs? Was that before we released the album, or was it? I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. So it was for. Uh, then we, uh, by the time we got this album out, then uh, Tron died yeah. on the way. You know. So what, what happened to him? I, 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 I everybody is talking about this guy. Mm. As an icon, uh, he's uh, <laughs> lots of cred and stuff. Yes. But I never really known the story about him. Can you please just tell me briefly about about the guy? Oh my God! You have. Uh, are we sitting here for next year? <laughs> uh, where to start? Then uh, he was a character. Uh, that's to say the least, of course. Um, he was a very productive guy, and he. He was the mastermind when from yeah the you know fingering most of the music coming out from Hanfoss being Urigal, Beastcraft, uh, you know, he made Ang Squadron. He released records with that one. He had Endesma, he had so much going on, you know. Guitar player. Yeah guitar player and he's a really creative uh, songwriter and stuff very good songwriter yeah. and and he could really like uh, put on a different hat you know uh, when he had a different band and like he could really put one band aside and then be into the really core of the other band and really uh, that's a rare feature yeah so i don't have that no that, but that's uh, that's not strange in one way that's yeah. normal in one way to because it's all absorbing i think to have so many to have your soul into so many uh, aspects and different yeah. corners that could be uh, that could be very really demanding so that's impressive yeah but uh, well how, how was he as a person he was a really really good guy he was uh, you know, he was like this outdoor guy hanging out, fishing. He was practically living uh, in the forest, uh, on the mountains, you know, so... But he was music uh, first and foremost, or was he into the image part of black metal? He was, the, it was the music. He was yeah. generally into those old bands, uh, technical bands, you know, Rush and all. He was like uh, really, really the music. So he wasn't know. like evil uh, as some <laughs> try to be who is evil uh, none of us are no, evil <laughs> i don't know said all uh, all people are evil uh, in the core well no no he was that was foremost uh, it was definitely the music, the music for him yeah. yeah yeah that's easy easy to tell it like that but of course uh, it was with soul and heart everything he did yeah. so in one way he lived it um, yeah, yeah. To- totally totally it was uh, the nature and the music that was everything. And his friends and us, and you know, we, we all had a good, uh, like, a good vibe and a close circle of yeah. friends uh, back then. So, what happened to him? He, he had uh, issues with a um, little bit uh, some depression pills and stuff, okay. and then a little bit escalated so into di- that bipolar and, kind of thing uh, i don't know it's um, hard to hard to tell that's uh, like another uh, yeah. to go into that i don't want to dwell into exactly why and what yeah. ended up but why well, he was down then uh, yeah and then but any, anyway it's just like he particularly particularly he died from a stroke then then he oh, really? was in his uh, in a cabin in the forest alone he was fishing and staying alone and 
found in there like he, he had a stroke like sitting over his fishing equipment and oh man uh, yeah how old was he uh, back then uh, is it like now it couldn't be that old uh, 34 34 yeah but this was in 2011 so now that's already nine years ago yeah, yeah. 30 32 three years yeah Oh, that's way too early. Yeah, of course, of course. So that's uh, tragic, of course. So, but it was uh, part like from a stroke. But so what uh, caused the stroke? Whatever that could be, whatever. But that's the heart stop. It is. The heart it. stop. That yep. was the end of his journey, and yeah. that's um, that's sad as it is. But that's how it is. So. But it seems like he died doing something he loved. Then. Exactly. He was out alone in the forest fishing. For him, it was like uh, dying with his boots on, you know. There it's, you go. Yeah. yeah. So he was uh, in in the environment that he wanted to die if he yeah. could choose, you know. Uh, it's it more, would be on the stage or in a studio or in the forest. And I think from these three uh, monsters, he would uh, choose the, the forest yeah. and the environment. Uh, it's morbid was. to talk about it like this, but it's a, it's a <coughs> good thing that he went that way. Yeah. Uh, you can say it like And when that. the heart stops, you don't suffer. No, I it don't just think stops. So. You know? Yeah, yeah. I, so, I hope so. So, yeah. yeah. But I was he was he in the band uh, or did he quit? Uh, was he out of Endesma by then? Uh, he was. He was the. He was like the creative force in the band. He was uh, still writing with you. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Not uh, had the time to play. We haven't released Erotic Necrosis back then. We have recorded it, but it was still not released. And he made. 60 percent of the album so he was like the creative force and did you make that song i mentioned uh, enigma of the salad yeah that was not him actually okay no. okay <laughs> yeah, actually yeah. that's uh that was not him that was the other uh thomas diabolus that made that that one yeah but uh he was uh, definitely the creative force and but still at that point urgal was a very busy busy band and they they just got bigger and bigger and was traveling more and more and playing more and more gigs and touring more and all festivals all the time. So we had a backup like uh, that's uh, when we yeah probably on the search when we back then searched for like where you were in the picture and yes. whatever. But we put out uh, I put out an advertisement in uh, a music magazine. Is this after. when Nils comes? Uh... Uh, no. That's later on. Okay. This was when Mattis uh, oh, yeah. joined. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I put out uh, this, like uh, the old, uh, just putting out the advertisement, and because you know it was always like easy to turn around, you know, and asking people that you know from other bands or whatever. But I thought, hey, then that's just been the story all the way, you know. You just find someone, and then He's he busy. have another band, he have this project, yeah, whatever. I just wanted to find someone that could uh, be there, you yep. know, yes. for a longer period, and that uh, want to be a part of it, like make it their own. So then was uh, God send, Devil send. That uh, actually I got a lot of answers, and one of them was uh, from uh, Malfas Matis, our current guitarist today and creative force and. Now the heart of Endesma alongside myself. So, so that was lucky that he put in an uh, answer that one. And um, where is he from? He is from Brandbu, then above uh, Hønefoss, so just like fifty one hour drive above Hønefoss. North. Uh, yeah. Okay. Up, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Between Jøvik and Hønefoss, or. Okay. Uh, there you yeah. go. Yeah. So, um, but what was he? So he was <coughs> didn't have a band at that point. He had a smaller like he had, project. Yeah, he had had his band, but then of course, then back then, and Desma was bigger than the bands that he had yeah. going. You know, some demo bands. So or for whatever. him, it was uh, it was a step up. Uh, yeah, definitely yeah. Uh, back then. Yeah. So then uh, that was a step for him into the more bigger picture or thing. Definitely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that worked uh, very well. He just, uh, we, ever since uh, I got a new guitarist, new friend, new everything. So that's, uh, that, uh, that was amazing. Uh, sad 
to lose Tron, of course, yes. in that uh, that thing that can't be. That's another topic and yeah, yeah, yeah. To- another thing. But uh, band wise, it's uh, it worked out with him and, uh, and the new guys. And then actually, it was after a rut, like you mentioned, Nils he came in after then when Diablos quitted a few years later, and I uh, one year later. Yeah. Then Nils came in, and then a few years later, we got the new drummer. Now we've been pretty much the same lineup for quite some years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So now, yeah, it was good to finally got that place to be like a force to be that working good together. In you can shape so. something together, and you will become tight units. Yeah, you know. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I know so, exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. So yeah course you the, do so. the worst thing in the world is to have to <coughs> exchange someone or uh, find a step in yeah or, i know that's never that's just a bypass to some you know it's it's not working in the end of course so and i also like it you know to be you are no maybe your band you are more like a solo project you're having maybe sessions with you but I, I more like to I want to people like to feel like to be a part of it, you know, right, to, yeah, yeah. in one way to even though if you ask them I'm pretty they would probably say I make the decisions uh, <laughs> pretty much, but still I want at least people to feel they are uh, going along <laughs> making decisions, you know. Yeah, I, oh, but they even need to feel they are a part of the ride, you know. That's yeah, we, important we have for me. that same thing, you know, yeah, but yeah. I create the music, but everything else yeah, we do together. Exactly, you know? exactly. Yeah. And I'm uh, so but, but when it comes to music comes to the music now it's like Mottis uh, he's the he's the main controller there and uh, he's the main drive force in the the creative thing and so he's, Sometimes uh, it's it's the smartest decisions to let the most clever songwriter take care of the songwriting. Yeah. If you know what I mean. Rather, yeah, of course. That's it's like it, a CEO, you giving a task to the, you know, giving the right task to the right guys, yes. you know, so in one way, of course. And uh, With the guidance, of course, I, we all have input. I have strong inputs and in where I want to go and where we want how to make it, how to sound like and everything and the riffs and the sound. But but I suppose you focus more on the lyrics. Uh, yeah, I make all the lyrics, of yeah. course, and uh, like the, the visual, like the world in one way. But mm. uh, of course, that's uh, that's what I do. But And then... We just set shapes and frames on where we want with a new album and where we want to how, where we want to end in one way, you know, and what kind of structure we want and so. And then Matti start to make riffs then, and then we take it from there and we change riffs, throw them out in, make them longer, shorter, cut them out, whatever if it's and then. But he make. Uh, usually he know what it takes and yep. what it makes so um, yeah. he uh, he's good at it he <laughs> usually delivers the product yes yeah yes. the goods yes but how is the songwriting process for you today yeah. or uh, since you're not a player you know yeah. oh i'm involved you mean or? no uh, what is your part here yeah in the lyrics and what do you do how do you go about doing uh, yeah, write all the lyrics. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you write lyrics without the music, for example? Uh, yeah, I first As poems. Yes, first I write and uh, then I adapt them. Uh, sometimes I have the tunes, the, the the words before, so I can. Uh, so I a little bit when I if I'm into the creative process that I can like, for instance, tell him what I wish like a little bit this party to make it fit with because I have an idea for the for the vocals or something. But uh, usually I just make the lyrics and then when the song is finished I adapt them in one way. Yep. I just rewrite them again. Make them fit. Yeah. Totally. And then I change the like the core, like uh, because like the new album is a concept album in one way. Okay. Uh, so everything is so I could like I can change lines and make them fit better and make the so I adapt them uh, in the end then to but still that is the core the core uh, meaning of the song the mean it's still there but I just adapt them in the end to 
make them fit fit the music. Yeah. yeah. So you you write lyrics as poems for yourself. Uh, yes. How pretty, is pretty that much. process for you? Is it uh, do you sit down with a pen and paper? Yes, I at do. At night time, or what? What is your process? Yeah, then I sit usually. Uh, I'm asking because I'm wondering because yeah. I do the same thing. It's you know? going in periods. You know, you have periods you are really productive. Like yep. I can write uh, five lyrics in a week, and then you get writer's block. Yeah, that's the <laughs> that's the good thing. Uh, to get that, especially when you need it the most to produce a lot of stuff. But yeah. um, but actually, I'm I'm like I love to write. When I was a kid in school, you know, the teacher, when we just had learned to write, you know, we the teacher could tell us, "Hey, you need to write three pages a story," and all the kids say, "Oh fuck, I don't want to do this and write three lines and that's it." I wrote. 10 side like pages you know in three i would i'm just uh, i love to write and have this imagination i'm just producing words so for me i like it uh, you know i i write uh, poetry poems besides this i can so actually when for the new album now we i think it's i wrote three sets of lyrics i just wrote one done and i Put it away because it took some time yeah and then i'm not satisfied i make new i so i don't usually i have no problems in writing and i sit down in nights and i lie. i just need to get into the right environments and the right atmosphere what is that that's just like maybe with a good beer uh wine and uh some si- si- music uh, so music in the background yeah yeah I just need because I'm so much focused on everything when I hear something. I just it's naturally for me to I snap up the lyrics. If it's of course if it's abrupt or something that you really can't uh, sort out what's being said. So, but uh, if I hear the lyrics, uh, then our problems run because I will sit and listen to the lyrics. Okay, always. so you need you listen to black metal then? Uh, I listen to some put backside mu- background music yeah, that yeah. just running, or either I just know it on just some vibes that are running in background that I need. Like now we have a we have a, a, a dimmed light and some candles. Uh, yeah, yeah kind of like that. That's good atmosphere with yeah, some yeah. little. Uh, music in the background and just uh, you by yourself alone yeah yeah then that's it so and that's like i said i like to write i'm writing on a book as well so i'm you uh, are yes i I am writing on a book let's hear it (laughs) let's uh, let's hear it out (laughs) yeah well um I haven't been uh, that public about uh, that uh, news. Uh, you don't need to break the news, but just tell break me the news. Uh, what, what is uh, it? No. What is the, what's your book? Uh, some it's um, adult slash children book. May I would say fiction. Uh, yes, definitely. It's uh, based on Norwegian mythical characters and uh, fairy tale, old Norwegian fairy tales. Uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, so... Uh, but in a new form, uh, in a way. Yeah, I make, make a build on already known characters and make new mythical characters. Make like a small universe with new uh, mythical creatures, and but based on the old, uh, the classic Norwegian fairy tales and classic stories that people relate to. If, yeah. if they know their... Uh, all the history when it comes to fairy tales and mythical uh, mythology, like you know, that, of course. How long so, have you been doing this? This I've been doing, planning this, for, uh, working on the process for a year. Like uh, I'm like when I have an idea, I need to I need to process in my mind for a bit. I need to grow, uh, grow in my mind to like. Uh, so you've been thinking about it for a year? Uh, more than that for long. I always, I actually now and then I like thinking of a book project, but I always thinking what how to approach it, uh, what but, it would be about and whatever. Yeah. yeah. So now we just like. Um, so now you have put the pen to the paper. Yeah. Now I'm writing and uh, I have uh, it will be illustrated. So I have uh, illustrated drawing the characters and stuff to it as well. An artist. So, yeah. Ah. Yeah. So it's. An, but what got you into that? What was the fuck? That's a good question. Uh, I just like I mentioned, I like writing. Then so yeah. it's like, uh, and then it's 
uh, it's just like when I like something, I just want to produce something in one way. That's I don't know. Awesome. It's um, so that's been a that's just been some dream I had to maybe to l- do a book. Do a book. That was like had a dream make a fan scene and then I did that the yeah. author <laughs> yeah so <laughs> yeah so no That's, actually I had a few ideas concerning it. we will see how but um, uh, yeah you'll see but it's will cross the worlds between my art history and I think so uh, with something I could bring in my bag on yeah. Tour. yeah but do you have a deal lined up no, no, that's the of course the, that's that's the thing that we need to sort. Out. But I think I will print the, my idea is to print in Norwegian, English, and German. Yeah, so I can bring it around and pretty much do it on your own. Yeah, you like the, the band as a distribution, if the, the touring. Uh, we'll see how yeah. if it's connectable. Yeah. But um, yeah. that's the yeah. We, that's a smart thing to have it in the merch, you know. That's the idea. So we see how this outcome, uh, how dark it will be to fit into this. But um, maybe no kids will uh, dare to buy it, so it will be for uh, adults. But uh, anyway. Make uh, the drawings cozy. Yeah, exactly. Make the cool cuddling bears <laughs> yeah. and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's... Uh, no, but it's exciting to see. see. So now, had some time now to in this period and of course it's perfect more, so. now yeah so no live performing or anything like that yeah it's good use now the to, time man i can write two three books now yeah so, yes how so. many pages are you aiming for um that's uh, as we go along but i think it the, the, you can tell 50 100 pages that depends so many letters you have on or, or big letters or whatever you know the whole the format will be but uh, uh it's like a norm maybe 100 couple of hundred pages yeah yeah and then novel yeah and then with a illustration maybe every 15 20 pages or something you should do a series yeah i've been thinking there yeah the new tolkien yes you know (laughs) but still (laughs) uh, uh, we need to make uh, book number one and then we take it from there but uh, hopefully that's a yeah tempting idea yes that's fascinating man yeah Thank you. You are full of surprises, sir. Full of surprises. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. So, um, yeah, we'll see how that's going. But still, it uh, takes time as well. Yeah. But uh, it's, it's. I guess it will fell into pattern and first first time around, it's like learning. Of it's course. a learning process, you know, yeah. like everything else you have to, it's something new. And maybe that's also what's exciting for me because it is something new and um, so but we see at least i want to figure it out and follow the idea to the to the end so we see how it yeah uh, you up. don't you do not seem like a quitter to me uh no no uh, maybe i don't do that because you did the fan scene you did the label you did the band and now you're on the book yeah and you don't you don't ever turn from it it seems what you're what you're heading into that's that's true no i like to i like to think that i go through with things go through with things yeah. that's that's true that's true yeah that's Maybe a really I good hope. feature to have yeah. i hope so but now it's like you know like you grow up like earlier you know when you look back on the fan scenes on the labels whatever the i think like the motivation for doing those things back then and now you know it's a little bit different and it's from another perspective you know now because now you have the the business issues with everything you know and and now you partly it's a dream like to do it because i'm productive i like to produce and be creative you know and do that that kind of thing but it's also now we need to pay off, you know, if you put effort in it and you put money and you're now you, your time is uh, the most valuable thing you yeah. have, you know. Yes. So we need to, it can't just be yet another big project that doesn't, you know, it's Go just anywhere. for fun, you know. You, no. you need, that's why it took maybe a lot of time to make this uh, ready, to make yeah. the child be ready to... Uh, throw it out in the world you know because yeah. it's need to be something when you first do it so 
it's just like like waste of time, you know. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. So we see how that goes. It's um, I think uh, yeah, it can be a original thing, but that's so we see how it how it works, how yeah. it's um, how it's going, everything with it. But uh, how is it on in present day uh, Desma? What is going on now? The ban, uh, this COVID nineteen is going on now. Uh, you know all about that, I guess. I do. Uh, we have uh, pretty much everything ready for the new album. We have new videos. We have. Um, I saw the videos. You did, yes. You they did. were great. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, the, it's. Uh, we are very satisfied. We was lucky to finish the videos just right before this uh, virus thing came along. Yeah. Where did you shoot them? We shot them in Hanfoss, uh, oh, in did? our home. Yeah. Okay. In our home, uh, in our uh, hometown, uh, or Jemnaker slash Hanfoss around and in the, in the scenery, local area. Yes, and uh, it was Gilherm Enrique from Gaera, mm. from uh, Portugal. Very creative, good uh, music video director. He flew to Norway and he was here for a period. Shot the two videos. And Only him. Only him, and he had one. Uh, he'd help. Okay, so two camera uh, yeah, yeah. operators. Yes, yes. Ah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so we spent some time here. We shot the videos, and um, they was ready. Then, in the middle of the, the like I told you, the epicenter of the COVID. Uh, then we had everything ready, like the album and videos and. Yeah. The artwork is ready. Everything we have, we are ready to rumble. But um, so now we're waiting, waiting, and um, so we can um, let it all out. And it's need to be the right time, of course, concerning touring and concerts and yeah, everything. Yeah. So, um, have you been playing at all during the COVID? No, not at all. So that's been it's been strange in one way. Because uh, this is the first time, man, in years that we're not going anywhere. Yeah, well, anywhere. Yeah, standing that's still. Crazy, and but when you look from it on a band perspective, it's like going on festivals, going. That's been something just rolling and rolling, and now it's just stopped. In one way, it's been also a little bit mind think like good in one way to get that thing a little bit off without feeling that you should have been there or whatever for me like to get a little distance to it you know yeah but you know that you're missing it now i guess i can feel that yeah i also can feel that it's good to not uh, have it around for a period that I actually i can i can feel that that's been totally okay as well but i also sense that i get restless and yeah. that's in my core to that I don't want to admit it, but maybe I'm a little bit, uh, you know, stressed. And, you uh, seem kind of restless. <laughs> I hope this shit will yeah, go over so soon. <laughs> could be I just tell telling me myself to calm myself down. Ah, oh, this is good. Uh, to, <laughs> yes, yes, just shaking and telling me this is good. <laughs> oh, man. I actually received, uh, I'm not, I, I haven't been talking about this either, but uh, I also have a new album, you know. Yeah. And I received the artwork today. Today? The original piece is over there on the on the kitchen bench. Okay. I will okay. show it uh, later. I'm looking forward to that. So uh, everything is ready, you know, but uh, because of this, uh, we have to wait. Exactly. We do. Then we're ready. We go on a big tour together. And we, yeah, we, we have to, we have to uh, celebrate this. Yeah. <laughs> When we're starting, we are just uh, we're just uh, full of energy to do it. I'm not going to spill the beans, but uh, me and Morten, we are already talking about doing something uh, this late summer, actually. So uh, yes, we are. So we, we are, are waiting for confirmations on that, and uh, as soon as it's up, That's you will cool. you will, will know be, about it. That will be amazing. Looking forward to that. So I hope everything um, goes down as planned. Yeah, so for we sure. can kick some ass. We actually had uh, our first uh, concert this weekend. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah of course, I saw uh, you played uh, on Blue. Was yes. it? Yeah. In Bro, Oslo. Bro in Oslo. Yeah. yeah. We had uh, maybe seventy people. Seventy people, right? Because it was like the social distancing yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. So it was like tables, and people had to stand. Oh in, my god! Uh, you know. <laughs> this reminds me when I was in. Yes, I'm in the 
in the watching um, watching mayhem in the kulturhuse på Jessheim and sitting in seats in the movie theater eating popcorn and watching mayhem what was this uh, this could have been wow it's all uh, 10 years ago maybe yeah i think so yeah in seats in seats yeah <laughs> in seats you could buy popcorn soda and sitting seats and watch mayhem and uh, at the end they throw uh, the pig heads out yeah. so we just sat there with uh, some part of a pig in one hand and your popcorn in the other <laughs> 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 so that's strange yeah <laughs> but it must have been good to have some some audience at least to uh, yeah, not yeah, yeah. be standing there in front of empty because empty place. we did a, a only streaming one month ago or two yeah with only camera people yeah but that was totally different of course yeah of course and uh, we had uh, you know Vidar Langerud slangen yes he, he was, was the front row oh, and, of course uh, if it was one ticket for sale it would be yeah but it was it, nice to have him there you know yeah of course of course I've been joking to myself about this, but to me, he's kind of a quality stamp. Exactly. If we play in Norway and I, I don't see him first row... I, then you're doing something wrong. And I go back. And there's no point in continuing. <laughs> <laughs> a big salute to Vidar. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> no, I think even the audience were like, you know, big-eyed, you know. They, yeah. they appreciated the live show. Of course. Yeah. So that's it was a really good night. and uh, People are hungry. And yes. Of course, that's... That's normal. So, yeah, but it's cool. That seems like things are slowly, slowly starting to move again. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's good. That's Do you good. have anything booked now? Uh, yes, we have uh, booked the same thing we had. Uh, was supposed to do this summer. And okay, we, so for next year. Yeah, then. yeah, we're all like, we're going to Metal Days. Uh, we're playing a few festivals in Germany and London. Uh, and all these things are just pushed so we pretty much have the same thing uh, yeah and I don't know it seems like people are a little bit reluctant with booking new things uh, I don't know how much you are getting booked from, from the, the insane stuff, but... thing is that we have a lot of stuff coming up yeah, yeah. that is the booking like for still without knowing what's when yeah, things will we happen. have yeah. a tour uh, booked uh, this year actually in mm. December, yeah, but it's not uh, been official. Uh, no, no, of course yet. But uh, we have a tour then. We have, I think, we have several tours next year. Yeah, and festivals. Yeah. L- luckily, of course, you of know, course, we That's... have something to do. Yeah, but uh, who is doing your booking, by the way? Uh, now it's uh, now it's a French uh, French booking, no name agency that uh, doing our bookings. But yeah. mostly, I've been doing. So, uh, for yourself yeah i've been taking a lot of charge in uh, in doing that but now we're putting more with the new album we will put more more of all the management thing away to agencies and yeah. stuff and like doing it because simply you don't have the time and one way you need uh, tell me about it's it. the system you know we just need uh, like we talked about earlier give away things to those that uh, know to do, uh, yes. do it proper and everything you know? yes so, yeah you, you're not you're not in the band to be a janitor exactly you know what i mean exactly so That's i know everything point. because we have done everything in-house yes but yes. now we have a booking agency and i feel pretty relieved yeah it's just like to let go in one way because yeah. that's for me been the most uh, like you tell uh, i want in one way to keep everything in house to yeah. have control but yeah. then at the end you meet yourself in the door so you, you do. just have to tell hey man that's something need to be put away you know so, yes yeah and because of uh we have never really been touring you know we have no. done one small tour yes but after I signed to the booking agency Doomstar, mm-hmm. they all of a sudden the tours came along. You yeah, know? yeah of course. so obviously I need to make the professionals do that. Yes, yes. Because that's to true. put together a tour for yourself? Uh, no, no, that's not. Oh man, that's working. No, no, that's, that's a heart attack. That's a heart attack, yeah. and that's uh, tours are even professionals put them together. The, yes, it's you get heart attack from that. Yeah, man, yeah, yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. So, no, that's good. But these guys is doing this for a living. So exactly. This is what they do. Yeah. So uh, that makes, should be good. Makes, makes sense. sense. Yep. Totally. Totally. So, uh, yes. 
Yeah. I don't know. We have talked about uh, your whole uh, career here. Yeah. Do you have any any thoughts? Any thoughts? Anything no. else you want to discuss? Some topics? No, uh, I don't know. No. Um, I don't know. Don't think so. No. That's. Do, oh. you have, do you have something to promote? To promote? I have been promoting now all the way. Yeah. Books and albums. And now it's it's just like I told we concerning Endesma, we have everything, the new album and uh, videos, everything ready to launch. I hope we could um, soon now. It's like middle of summer, but then right the summer is done. Now we will start launching info and news. Yeah. album titles and uh, cover artworks and launching videos and songs until the full album is being set and then I also hope we could uh, then nail tours and like make the plan for 2021 yeah that's pretty much uh, the next next step yeah and we also we started on the next album again to, we already have songs and started so if if it continues to uh, things be slow then we need to be uh, productive you know so of then, course so so and despa will be around for a long while i hope so yeah. that's the plan yeah so i i hope so that's the as long as we kicking and our heart is beating for doing it we will be around yeah and you brought me a gift today you brought me the album yes where can people pick that up uh the album should be pretty much all around you have distribution everywhere i suppose yeah yeah it's yeah. Uh, the arcanabis is uh, distributed to canlight i think uh, yeah. season of mist france canlight uk and europe uh, elsewhere and so it should be in stores where mostly. can uh, the fans pick up your merch uh, that's a little bit uh, here and there but uh, so you don't have that in-house no 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 that's uh, f- uh, that that would be the next step to fix something and set up to do something there yeah so we need uh, we're working now on some new web stores that will be launched and everything with the album is coming along through with the uh, Hopefully with the, the new labels and stuff, and then yeah. we can put uh, put something in system there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yes. Exciting time coming up. Yeah, I hope so. Label and album and uh, yes, yes. You just wait for the world to open up. So totally. Thank you for stopping by, man. Thank you for having me. It's been nice. My pleasure. Thank you. See you guys. See you. See you.